Chapter Four of It's Like This Cat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Meilinger. It's Like This Cat by Emily Shanley Neville. Chapter Four. Fight. I actually get a letter back from Tom Ransom. It says, "Thanks for your letter." The youth board got me a room in the Y on the 23rd Street. Maybe I'll come say hello some day. They're going to help me get a job this summer, so I don't need a lawyer. Thanks anyway. Mew to cat. Best, Tom. I go over to Nick's house to show him the letter. I'd told him about Tom getting cat out of the cellar and getting arrested, but Nick always acted like he didn't really believe it. So when he sees the letter, he has to admit cat and I really got into something. Not everyone gets letters from guys who have been arrested. One thing about Nick sort of grips me. He has to think up all the plans. Anything I've done that he doesn't know about, he downgrades. Also, I always have to go in his house. He never comes to mine, except once in a coon's age, when I have a new record I won't bring to his house, because his machine stinks, and he never buys a new needle. It's not that I don't like his house. His mom is pretty nice, and boy, can she cook. Just an ordinary Saturday for lunch, she makes pizza or real good spaghetti, and she has homemade cookies and nut cake sitting around after school. She also talks and waves her arms and shouts orders at us kids, but all good-natured like, so we just kid her along and go on with what we are doing. She's about the opposite of my mom. Pop does the shouting in our house, and except for the one hassle about bike riding on 12th Avenue, Mom doesn't even tell me what to do much. She's quiet, and pretty often she doesn't feel good, so maybe I think more than most kids that I ought to do things her way without being told. Also, my mom is always home and always ready to listen if you got something gripping you, like when a teacher blames you for something you didn't do. Some kids I know, they have to phone a string of places to find their mother, and then she scolds them for interrupting her. Mom likes to cook, and she gets up some good meals for holidays, but she doesn't go at it all the time, the way Nick's mother does. So maybe Nick doesn't come to my house, because we haven't got all that good stuff sitting around. I don't think that's it, really, though. He just likes to be boss. One day, a couple of weeks after we went to Coney, he does come along with me. We pick up a couple of cokes and pears at his pop store. Cat is sitting on my front stoop, and he jumps down and rubs between my legs, and goes up the stairs ahead of us. See? He knows when school gets out, then it's time to eat. That's why I like to come home, I tell Nick. We say hi to Mom, and I get out the cat food while Nick opens his coke. You know those girls we run into over on Coney Island, he says. Yeah. Well, I've got the blonde's phone number, so Sunday when I was hacking around with nothing to do, I called her up. Yeah? What for? You stupid or something? To talk. She has yacked away a good while, and finally I asked her why didn't she come over next Saturday. We could go to a movie or something. Yeah, I was working on my pair, a very juicy one. That's all you can say? So she says, well, she might, if she can get her girlfriend to come too, but she doesn't want to come alone, and her mother wouldn't let her anyway. Which one? Which one what? Which girlfriend? Oh, you remember, the other one we were kidding around with at the beach, the redhead. So I said, okay, I'd see if I could get you to come too. I said I'd call her back. Hmm, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? How do I know if I like that girl? I hardly even talk to her. Anyway, it sounds like a date. I don't want a date. If they just happen to come over, I guess it's all right. So shall I tell them it's okay for Saturday? Hmm. It's nice you learned a new word. Do I have to pay for the girl at the movies? Cheap skate. Maybe if you just stand around saying, hmm, she'll buy her own. Okay? Okay, but this whole thing is your idea. And if it stinks, it's going to be your fault. Boy, what an enthusiast. Come on, let's play a record and do the math. Nick is better at math than I am, so I agree. Saturday morning at ten o'clock, Nick turns up at my house, in a white shirt and slick down hair. Pop whistles. On Saturday yet? You got a girl or something? Yes, sir, says Nick, and gives my t-shirt a dirty look. 
I go put a sweater over it and run a comb through my hair, but I'm hanged if I'll go out looking like this a big deal. We are going to the movie down at the Academy, I tell my family. What's there? Pop asks. A new horror show, says Nick, and an old Disney. Is it really a new horror show? I ask Nick, because I think I've seen everyone that's been in town. Yep, just opened. The Gold Bug. Some guy wrote it. I mean in a book once. But it's supposed to be great. Make the girls squeal anyway. I love that. Hmm. I just like horror shows anyway, whether girls squeal or not. You'll be the life of the party with that hmm routine. It's your party, I shrug. Well, you could at least try. We hang around the subway kiosks on 14th Street, where Nick said he'd meet them. After half an hour, they finally show up. It's nice and sunny, and we see a crowd bunched up over in Union Square, so we wander over. A shaggy-haired, bearded character is making a speech all about they, the bad guys. A lot of sleepy bums are sitting around, letting the speech roll off their ears. What is he, a nut or something? The blonde asks. A commie, maybe, I say. They're always giving speeches down here. Willie Sutton, the bank robber, used to sit down here and listen too. That's where somebody put the finger on him. The girls look at each other and laugh like crazy, as if I'd said something real funny. I catch Nick's eye and glare. Okay, I tried. After this, I'll stick to hmm. A beard who is listening to the speech turns and glares at us and says, Shush! Oh, go shave yourself, says Nick, and the girls go off in more hoots. Nick starts herding them toward 14th Street, and I follow along. At the academy, Nick goes up to the ticket window, and the girls immediately fade out to go read the posters and snicker together. I can see they are not figuring to pay for any tickets, so I cough up for two. Nick and I try to saunter up to the balcony the way we always do, but the girls are giggling and dropping their popcorn, so the matron spots us and motions, Down here! She flashes her light in our eyes and I feel like a convict while we get packed in with all the kids in the under-16 section. Nick goes in first, then the blonde, then the redhead and me. The minute things start getting scary, she tries to grab me, but I stick my hands in my pockets and say, Oh, it's just a picture. She looks disgusted. The next scary bit, she tries to hang on to her girlfriend, but the blonde is already glued to Nick. Redhead lets out a loud sigh, and I wish I hadn't got into this deal. I can't even enjoy the picture. We suffer through two pictures. The little kids make such a racket you can hardly hear, and the matron keeps shining the light in your eyes so you can't see. She shines it on the blonde, who is practically sitting in Nick's lap, and hisses at her to get back. I'm not going to do this again, ever. We go, and Nick says, Let's have a coke. He's walking along with the blonde, and instead of walking beside me, the redhead tries to catch hold of his other arm. This sort of burns me up. I mean, I don't really like her, but I paid for her and everything. Nick shakes her off and calls over his shoulder to me. Come on, chicken, pull your own weight. The girls laugh, on cue as usual, and I begin getting really sore. Nick got me into this. The least he can do is shut up. We walk into a soda bar and I slap down thirty cents and say, Two cokes, please. Hey, hey, the last of the big spenders, says Nick. More laughter. I just as soon sock him right now, but I pick my money and say, Okay, wise guy, treats on you. Nick shrugs and tosses down a buck, as if he had hundreds of them. The two girls drink their cokes and talk across Nick. I finish mine in two or three gulps, and finally we can walk them to the subway. Nick is gabbing away about how he'll come out to Coney one weekend, and I'm standing there with my hands in my pockets. Goodbye, Bashful, coos the red hat to me, and the two of them disappear, cackling down the steps. I start across 14th Street as soon as the light changes, without bothering to look if Nick is coming. He can go rot. Along Union Square, he's beside me, acting as if everything is peachy fine dandy. That was a great show. Pretty good fun, huh? I just keep walking. You sore or something? He asks, as if he didn't know. I keep on walking. Okay, be sore, he snaps. Then he breaks into a falsetto. Goodbye, bashful. I let him have it before he's hardly got his mouth closed. 
he hits me back in the stomach and hooks one in his ankles around mine so we both fall down it goes from bad to worse he gets me by the hair and bangs my head on the sidewalk so i twist and bite his hand we are gurgling and stretching and biting and kicking because we're both so mad we can hardly see and anyway no one ever taught us those queensbury rules there is no point in going into all the gory details finally two guys hold us apart i have hold of nick's shirt and it rips good he's half crying and he twists away from the guy that grabbed him and screams some things at me before darting across the avenue i'm standing panting and sobbing and the guy holding me says you ought to be ashamed now go on home ah you and your big mouth i said still mad enough to feel reckless he throws a fake punch but he's not really interested he goes his way and i go mine i must look pretty bad because a lot of people on the street shake their heads at me i walk in the door at home expecting the worst but fortunately mum is out pop just whistles through his teeth that must have been quite a horror picture he says End of chapter 4